Hi, it's nice to be here. Well, let's see, nurses? I always like to know who I'm talking to. Most people? Physicians, a few? All right, um, I spent 25 years in the nursing school at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm just gonna give you a few minutes so you know why it's okay for me to talk about this topic. I had to build up to there for five minutes. Um, I just retired in January of this year, so it's only a few weeks ago and I'm still trying to figure out that whole retirement thing and how that works. Um, my projects, of course, continue, and both of my current projects have to do with what I'm talking about today, how I discovered this thing that we're gonna talk about today. Um, one of my projects uh, was to open the door to commutation because it was closed in Pennsylvania. Um, in Pennsylvania, if you're sentenced to life, they mean life, life. It comes without parole, and that means you serve a life sentence. And from visiting prisons, I had a pretty good idea that there were certainly people that reformed themselves. I'm not gonna lie to anybody and say that the correction system should be called the correction system, and they work really hard on reforming people. No, you decide that for yourself. Uh, people who certainly had reformed themselves and should have a chance to go before the Board of Pardons and be, and be released. Um, so the door was effectively closed for political reasons we're not gonna talk about. I wanted to open it up again, and I've done that. So uh, in general, that comes from, I think it comes from uh, studying with Claire Fagan herself. I'm for, I was fortunate enough that to study with Claire um, who she taught me that nurses can do anything, and we can. Um, and so I thought, well, I can do this, and I did. So, and that's ongoing, trying to get more and more um, people out of prison. So I have certainly learned a lot about trauma <laughs> from people who are um, incarcerated and how those things go together, the trauma and the uh, incarceration. Right now I'm doing a, a mindfulness session. We're doing it over a number of weeks with women who are in jail in Philadelphia. Jail is different than a prison. Jail is where you go when you're first arrested. Chicago has the largest uh, jail in the country and Philadelphia is number two. As embarrassing as that is, it's true. Um, when I started working with women in jail, it was a little small unit that was within one of the men's jails and now it's a great big building because that's incarceration rate has soared uh, for women. So I have women right now who um, are in a unit that they call disciplinary. Why don't you just start your mindfulness sessions with the most difficult group in the jail? I didn't ask for that, someone assigned me to that. So um, it's, being, it's effective. I'm really, really happy with what I'm gonna teach you about today. Um, and the other place I've learned about trauma-informed care is that I did create one. I'm a partner uh, in, uh, with a woman who started transitional housing. She had one house for women coming out of jail. When I met her, we now have three. Um, so when women leave jail, they can come and stay with us. That's um, granted work, and I'm primarily focusing on their prostitutes and drug addicts. Um, the women who come into come into the house. So again, I've learned a great deal about trauma, and we've made the environment, what I'm gonna talk to you about today, a trauma-informed setting. Um, and it's very effective. I can, I can preach to you that what we're gonna talk about works, with, even with very, very, what you probably call a difficult kind of a client. It's, it's very effective. And let me take one minute to just give you my trajectory in terms of nursing. Um, like many young nurses, I started in an emergency department. Uh, that's where I worked. It'd be a trauma bay now. We didn't have trauma bays then. Uh, I was in nursing school in the 60s, end of the 60s. Um, and I love that adrenaline rush for people who work there. I just loved working there. It was every day, all day, on saving lives. It was just, at the end of the day, I felt really good about it. It took me a number of years to figure out that I wasn't gonna do that for the rest of my professional career because that was about myself. It was about me feeling good at the end of the day. It wasn't particularly about the people that I was taking care of. Does that make sense to this group? So I thought, you know, I need to do something different. So after that came the nurse practitioner. I'm a nurse practitioner in women's health, have been for many years since when no one knew what a nurse practitioner was. 
um, and then the, the PhD with, with Dr. Fagan. Imagine a healthcare setting where this is what happens. And this is how it works. That instead of asking people um, what happened, you know, what's wrong with you, we ask people what happened to you. That might explain some behavior that you're looking at. It's a totally, it seems like such a simple thing, but it's a totally different approach than thinking to yourself and expressing it in some verbal or nonverbal way that what you're really thinking is what's wrong with this person? This behavior is completely inappropriate or what they're saying is completely inappropriate. What's wrong with them? Um, to instead of processing it that way, you think about what happened to this person that would create this kind of behavior and this kind of a verbal response to something that I'm doing. I'm gonna to try to demonstrate to you that past trauma can be triggered by experiences in the present. This is true, it's been researched. I'm from Penn, I have to give you the research. I can't, I can't not. So even if this thing happened when they were very young, they've developed a way of coping with this, with whatever it was that was traumatic to this person. Um, and that's what you're seeing. Not that they're acting like they're still very young, but the coping mechanism that they've been using it their whole lives, and that's what you're, that's um, what you're seeing. Is committed to supporting people as they heal. Again, that sounds really simple, but it's a difficult thing to do. Uh, you want to be there as they progress from where you find them to where it is you want them to go. And that was part of the reason why ED wasn't making it for me. I started to worry about what happened to these people after they left me. Where'd they go? Did they do all right? <laughs> and how about all the people that kept coming back? Back. I'd seen this person before, you know, with some really profound Philadelphia moments like, wow, this kid had been shot. I remember before. This is the second time he's coming in um, with somebody who shot him. So following people through and finding out what happens to them. You don't have to do that personally. It would be nice if you had a team that did that. Um, and leaving a person empowered, so important that a person leaves our system um, feeling empowered like they've taken control of their own health because they are taking control of their own health. Everybody in this room knows we give them all these detailed instructions because we must, and they never do them, never. Never, we're just wasting time writing out these instructions and going over them with people. They know what they're gonna do and not do. So they have to own it. They have to own their own, whatever their own path is. And our job is to help them make healthy choices as they move along this, um, as they move along the path. Before I say what is trauma, I think you should think for just a minute about the power we have as nurses, since most people in this room are nurses. Uh, nurses have been the most trusted profession since I started. That position has never, ever changed. We are, we are the trusted professionals, and there are lots of people who would like to be in that position, but we're there, and we've been there for years. If you do a survey and you ask people, maybe you've seen these things, I don't know, somewhere, they ask people, What's your most trusted profession? It's us. Um, so what we say has a lot, and what we do has maybe a lot more power than you realize it does. It may just be an intervention. You might not even remember that you did it. But if you'd happen to see that person later, they'll remember everything you said and everything you did because it had a big implication uh, for them. We have incredible power as nurses, and we should use it. Okay, the definition of trauma, this is one, just a generic um, definition. It's an event that's very upsetting. So you have to start with a little bit of a definition. Some things that maybe some of you would call trauma wouldn't hit the, wouldn't hit the category. I mean, I know we all throw that word around. You know, this thing happened and it was really traumatic. Uh, but this has to be something, if you want to, if you want to use the word trauma in a professional kind of a way, you're either talking about the kinds of physical trauma that all of you see every day, um, or you're talking about this. You're talking about something that happened, probably a series of things that happened um, that overwhelmed that the person's internal resources. And just a little opening to when we get to talk about children for just a few minutes, part of that overwhelm is that often the kind of, people like the word abuse, I'm not really sure what it means, but the uh, whatever the traumatic experiences were happen to people when they're children. And they don't have the appropriate 
coping skills. They're not adults um, when these things occur. Adolescence, same thing. It can be a single event, has to be something overwhelming. Uh, usually it's not a single event, more often than not, it's many events um, over a period of time. So these are my ladies that are in the, are in the transition houses. Long series of traumatic experiences. I mean, how do you, how does one come to a point where you're selling your body to give money to pay for your dope in a situation that's gonna get you arrested? What, how did you get there that you're coming to me in the first place? And it starts way back when they're very young um, with all kinds of traumatic things that have, that have happened. And these ladies have to learn in the time that they're with us. I have funding for them to stay for a year. They have to learn what are their, what are their triggers and what do they have to do with and how can we do this? How can we do this differently? Um, certainly they're not all successes. When we get to examples, I'll share a few that that aren't. Um, violence between two people or more than one person um, creating a violent situation for you, all right? Uh, it's, it, it really ranks high if it's a trust person who does that. It's someone you should be able to trust. It's the people you live with. You're young, you live with these people, you expect they're gonna care for you. Um, I've met a lot of ladies now coming through the coming through the transition houses who tell me that no one in their lives ever has told them they love them. People who can tell me they've never, ever heard that. It's like hard to imagine. And their description of their, um, their violent lives growing up, it's just, it took a while to process that for myself. Multiple traumas get you down the paths where I'm seeing you in a prison or a a jail. Okay. You're gonna you're gonna forgive me for a little bit of neurobiology, right? You are, yes? I'm sorry. <laughs> Before I do it, I'm sorry. Um, but people who are into putting folks in scanners, and we have those researchers at Penn, put people in F MRI, uh, MRIs, but they're functional MRIs. They're not the same MRIs you do to, to diagnose and treat people. It's a kind of an MRI where you can be moving around and doing things. So I can do, um, Ruben Gurr's work is ongoing and what he does is ask people to lie in the fMRI. He gives them playing cards and he'll ask them when they're looking at one playing card, what is it? And they're supposed to lie and he wants to see what part of their brains light up. There's all kinds of different work being done with um, neurobiology and I enjoy it myself, I love that. Watch what they produce. Okay, um, but I'll show you a, a little diagram of a brain in a minute. Um, but what you're reading is it. it. It interferes with your development. So how, how old you are when the trauma begins and continues. Um, and your capacity to integrate sensory, emotional, and, and cognitive. We can see it um, on, your, on your brain scan, which is really kind of fun, I think. Here's the silly drawing. It's a functional MRI. Okay, so I'm asking you to talk about something traumatic and we're looking at when your brain lights up. That's more Adrian Rain's work um, than, than Ruben Gers. Okay, so what's really important about this, I think, is that you understand that emotional and sensory things process cognitively the prefrontal lobe and the frontal lobe, that's your smart stuff. Which gets us all the way back to Aaron Beck who invented cognitive behavioral therapy. Aaron Beck is still alive, he invented it at Penn. He's a very elderly gentleman. I've seen him a few times, I've had a few conversations with him um, on the telephone. His theory was that if you could change people's thinking, cognitive, you could change people's thinking, you can change their behavior. And there's just about, I'm not a psych nurse, I've never been a psych nurse, but now that I'm reading this literature because of the populations I'm working with, that's right. That is what we're trying to do. Enter in through cognitively to affect the emotional and sensory. We're going 
the root, they took a different path out, right? It went from sensory and emotional to cognitive to the kind of response that you see. We're trying to use the cognitive to change some of the emotional uh, responses that we get. So Liz had an important thing she dropped when she was talking to you about breathing, and that's focus. One of the problems you see with people who have been subjected to trauma and a lot of stress in their lives is that it's very difficult for them to focus and be in the moment. Do we have anybody in here who works with adolescents? Relatively smart group. We don't have anybody who works with adolescents. They're really, they're difficult. I'll certainly admit that. Okay, but you see a lot of that unfocused due to maturity. Uh, they're very immature, adolescents. Yes, you'll agree? Yeah, so some of you maybe have adolescents in your house. Can nod when I say this, that it's tough to keep them on topic. They're kind of all over the place. You're trying to get them to go somewhere and they don't wanna go there, that's immaturity. Their brains are not developed, we know that. That's neurobiology again, we know their brains are not developed and they're not developed till they're 25. Not all the way. Okay, um, so the person who, the researcher that you need to know who developed the trauma-informed care um, idea is Bessel van der Kolk. Tough last name, you'll see it in print in a minute. But he's the one who's done all the research and it's very mainstream for us. It's National Institute of Health funded, it's NIH funded all his work. Uh, it's very well done. He's an MD and a psychiatrist. And he writes fabulous things like, Reminders of the past automatically activate certain neurobiological responses. Thus, people can react irrationally, responses can be irrelevant and even harmful. And that is what you're seeing at times. What, what got um, Bessel van der Kolk interested in this was that he decided that PTSD wasn't enough in trying to explain what happens with people if they've been traumatized, that that belonged to populations, but it didn't get the overall, that PTSD was being defined uh, well after the, the Vietnam uh, War. People were looking for what was happening with these guys who were coming back from the, um, coming back from the military, and putting that with what he was seeing about sexual assault to, um, it's my um, colleague, Ann Burgess, who wrote a lot of that, a lot of that work, what kind of responses you can get to the trauma of sexual assault. And there were people at the same time writing about domestic violence and what kind of responses you get to that, um, plus a smattering of publications about accidents, wars, assaults, the things that you're reading there, natural disasters. And he thought, well, there has to be something that brings all this stuff together. And what would be the thing? Why do we have to look at it by what happened to them? Don't they all have something in common? They do, um, this thing that we're talking about today. They do have something in common. And PTSD, uh, in my opinion, is a really overused term because that's the term most people know and have in their toolbox. So everybody who's been traumatized has PTSD. I wanna broaden your thinking away from that and out a little bit from the literature that says these are the things you need to do for PTSD, broaden you out to thinking about some other things. Okay, post-traumatic pathology creates, I think it's, I would call it more than um, PTSD. Dysfunction of, this should work, of affect, yes? What does that mean? What do you remember about what affect is? When we write down that somebody's affect's inappropriate or it's shallow or it's, what kind of descriptors do you use? What do we mean by that? Can you say it a little louder for me? Yes, we do. Right. It can be a flat affect, you don't, that's how they present, like not with much of anything. Um, all the way to the range of people who are coming into you in some kind of screaming and running around mode and everything in between. It does mean the way that they 
um, the way that they present to you. Alteration is in attention. People, again, having difficulty focusing on the moment. This is what you're talking about now, and now you're shifting to something else, and they can't make the, they can't make the shift with you because they have attention problems. Everybody knows what somatization is? Okay. Um, I was one of the people who worked in the emergency department years when I was much younger than now and had no, didn't know any of the stuff I'm talking to you about. I was one of those people that was right in with the culture of calling those folks frequent flyers. <laughs> oh, geez. This person's here again. And we'd be like, who is going to take care of this person? I did it last time. <laughs> you know, you do it. You do it this time. That person is a pain in the you know where. That was the culture in the emergency department. There was no, there was no sympathy for people that were somatic. Last week they have a headache. This week they have an upset stomach. You know, they said, I'm really tired of this. We had a little term back in the day in Philadelphia. It was called Gomer. Did that ever get up here? <laughs> get out of my emergency room. That's how awful we were um, to people. Because I wasn't smart enough to know that when they're coming back and back and back to you with various different things, and it gets followed all the way down. You know, they get every study known to man. They don't have any of these things. That It's this. I just wasn't smart enough to, to know that. Um, and the last, yes, I have to give you some admissions of, I, I, never, there, I have years of not doing any of this right, but I didn't know. Um, the last bullet is important, alterations in self-perceptions, how they feel about themselves. Very, very difficult with the population that, the populations I work with now. Very, very difficult. Their feelings about themselves are no way match yours. <laughs> they uh, are not feeling good about themselves, and it shows in different kinds of ways that they, um, that they behave and things that they say. They don't have confidence about themselves at all because of their history of, of trauma. They have problem in relate, problems with relationships. No surprise. No surprise. Difficult to have a relationship if you have not yet worked through what happened to you in previous um, relationships. What is it, what's my meaning of self and other people? These folks have boundary issues. What's me, what's you? Where do I establish the boundary? Some people keep them way out here. They don't trust anybody. And I work with a lot of those folks. It takes time to get, to get close to them. We are fooling ourselves that somebody's going to come to you and on a first encounter, they're going to trust you and tell you about the important things in their lives. They're not. You can ask them. What are they going to say? No, no, no to all those questions until there's some kind of, they trust you a little bit. Unlike the rest of the population that's being surveyed, saying we're the best ever, people who've been traumatized, they're scared of everybody, including you. They don't trust. They don't want to let you in. They don't want to tell you these things because they're not sure how you're going to react. You might be very judgmental, and they don't want that. You might be angry with them and not provide the care they're looking for. So they just bottle it up. They don't show you these things. This is just a thing to remember. More trauma, earlier trauma, longer exposure. The longer it goes on, um, and whatever is exactly happening to this person, all the things that are happening to this, um, to this person, they have more they have more symptoms. So I'm going to show you a little video because I think we want to talk a little bit about, yeah, I want you to see um, what Dr. Vanderkoek looks like. It's a little short video you can see. He's still here. He's still around. He's still writing. 2016, he has a couple publications. He still exists. So we're talking about something that's relatively new and it's way okay if you came here not knowing what trauma-informed care was. That's happened to me before. Okay. Machen wir das auf Deutsch? Nein. 
Hollandish. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make the, the playing field even. We'll do it in Dutch, okay? <laughs> so today I am interviewing Bessel van der Kolk, one of the leading persons in the field of trauma therapy. His best-selling book is translated in many languages. And I just was wondering, we both have been born around the end of the Second World War, how such traumatic happenings to the whole society have been influencing us all to go to such a field. And that would be my first question. Well, for me, certainly, what I learned experientially in the Second World War and its aftermath uh, was the defining question of my, of my life, my childhood. Uh, how can people do such unspeakable things to each other? And I grew up in a religious society, a religious family, where people preached love and goodness, and then you saw, saw this incredible cruelty happening all, all around yourself. You know, a large segment of my generation actually died at the last year of the war of hunger. Um, I didn't, but I barely survived. Uh, my father was in the camp. My uncle came back from the Japanese concentration camp. And my whole childhood is about the aftermath of unspeakable cruelty. So during this time, end of the war, many of the now modern techniques of trauma therapy have not been in the world. You could not treat such people somehow the way we are doing yeah. it now. You are well known for combining a lot of things. Can you explain what is your approach which you are describing in your new yeah. book? Well, actually, what is striking about trauma is how it gets discovered and forgotten. And so, actually, my first opening to learning about trauma was learning about Pierre Genet, who wrote about it in the 1870s, 1880s, and had a very rich therapeutic armamentarium, and then he got moved out of his institution in 1902. Then trauma therapy gets reinvented in his First World War, stops again right after the war is over, again in the Second World War. And by the time I worked with Vietnam veterans, there was no understanding about trauma whatsoever. But when we started to go to the library, we found that there was a lot of stuff before us. And so the interesting thing about trauma is that the people who suffer from it want to forget it because it's too much. And society wants to forget it because it's too much also. And so this is not a popular subject. Just like traumatized people themselves are not popular people. Uh, because they remind us about how irrational society is and that rational solutions cannot always take care of things. So it, it stirs up a lot of issues always. Um, and so the, the first thing with, with trauma treatment is that people can tell the truth about what happened. And that's extremely difficult because people are filled with shame. Uh, people get condemned for getting stuck in it. People say, why don't you go on with your life? Why do you keep whining about the same old thing again? And so traumatized people tend to get very isolated and locked up in their own uh, misery and then find the company of other people who have suffered just like they do. And then they have a, get an identity of we are sufferers and then their life still gets stuck. I think the most important thing is that we discovered that trauma changes the brain. And so a lot of people still think that trauma is something that happens to you that is a story about the past. Um, but that's a story about the past. What really is a trauma is that your brain gets changed and you see the world differently and you live in a different body, and you diff live in a different world where you see things differently and experience things differently from other human beings. Mm -hmm. And so the great challenge of trauma treatment is how to help people to feel fully, feel fully alive and to um, to detoxify themselves from the impact of the trauma. That's, that's actually the big issue. Um, and there's many different methods of doing that. And in my book, I describe various things. A very important piece, aside from language, is uh, the issue of your body. Uh, that trauma is not a story that sort of lives out here as an abstract tale of what happened. Uh, as Darwin already pointed out back in 1872, 
uh, trauma is lived out in heartbreak and gut-wrenching, gut-wrenching experiences. So mm-hmm. it's, it's really, you feel it over here. <laughs> and every language of the world has a world for heartbreak and gut wrench. And so when you're traumatized, you feel these awful sensations of dread and helplessness and disgust and horror in your body. And in response to that, you try to numb out your body. And the most common way of doing that is drugs and alcohol. So the, the comorbidity between trauma and drugs and alcohol is gigantic. Uh, research shows that it's almost impossible to become a drug addict without having a prior history of childhood trauma, let's say. And, and it's very important to understand these ways as uh, drug addiction, some alcoholism also, as ways in which people desperately try to manage unbearable sensations. Then what we learned is that, you know, in the West, in Europe and North America, uh, we rely mainly on drugs and alcohol and yakking to get over trauma. And then what it turns out is that in Asia, Africa, other parts of the world, people have found ways of calming that body down with things like Qigong and yoga. And that really reacquaint yourself with your body, helps you to calm your body down, and these things are called alternative therapies. Uh, to my mind, drugs are alternative therapies, and dealing with your body is real therapy because it is about where the trouble is, is namely in the way you breathe and the way you move and the way you hold your body. And so I did the first National Institute of Health funded study on yoga, and it turned out that yoga was a more effective treatment for PTSD than any medication any of us had ever studied. Okay, I want to give you one more background piece. And this is a study that if you've never seen the ACE study, I would suggest that sometime you take a look at it. You need to, in order to think about incorporating some of the concepts, like some of the principles from yoga into your practice, I think you need a window in seeing how prevalent this really is uh, in, this, in this country and in this, and in this culture. And the ACE study is the window in. Um, so I'll show you a couple of numbers and how they did this in a minute. Um, but it was, they were looking at a well population, it was done by Kaiser Permanente, um, you know, as a health insurer, right? Um, and they asked people questions about their adverse child experiences. That's what they called them. They have definitions for what they exactly mean by that. They asked people about those things happening that were coming in for physical exams. It was, Nothing they expected to turn up, I'm sure, what it, uh, what it showed. And this little piece from the ACE study, uh, it's just a little drawing, so I can do it simply for you um, because of time. You have adverse child experiences, whatever they might, whatever they might be. And then this one will ring a lot of bells for all the nurses such as myself. Those adverse child experiences, if you haven't done anything to deal with those experiences, and most people do not, um, then you start to see social, emotional, and cognitive impairment. You start to see people that aren't you, um, or maybe where you aspire to be. They don't react socially the way you would expect them uh, to. They're emotionally all over the place and make it, making it difficult for you to take care of them. And just talking to them sometimes is not enough. And then this rings a bell for me in my whole professional career, adoption of health risky kinds of behaviors. That's what people do who've had traumatic experiences. Yes, I said I I work with women who are prostitutes and, and drug addicted. How did they become drug addicted? They had all kinds of trauma in their lives. So the, often the drug addiction comes before the prostitution, more than the literature would like you to think. It's not always the prostitution can be first. You're a young adolescent, you run away from home, and how else are you going to make some money? You don't know anything. You're 14 or 15 years old. It can go that route with the trafficked people or the adolescent runaways. Um, but the other way happens just as often, probably more often. 
they're treating their own trauma with the medication that they can get on the street. And sometimes it's difficult for us to be empathic about that because if we had these issues, we would deal with them, but they're not us. <laughs> and we have the ability, if I wanted to be high all the time, how would I do it? I wouldn't buy anything off the street. I would be worried about what they would be giving me off the street. I'd be worried about losing my license, right? What would I do? I'd use our own system, right? I'd, I'd be able to get an appointment with someone talk to someone, they'd give me medication, you know they would. There's a big movement now to stop them from so freely giving some of the, some of the medications because that's us. But if you're people who've been seriously traumatized, living in not good neighborhoods, living in poverty, where do you get your drugs? They're not gonna get it from our system. They don't have the ability to get it from our system. So they buy it on the street. They don't have health insurance. They buy it on the street. And they don't wear seat belts. It doesn't matter what you say. If you think you're not gonna live much beyond 20 or 25, what are you wearing seat belts for? You take the risk of not wearing seat belts. Am I starting to make sense? People that keep smoking. My goodness, I met a woman while I was in Chicago just recently who told me she was hospitalized, she they asked her to stay overnight. She wasn't planning on being overnight for whatever it was. So she got out of bed, put another gown on backwards, threw her, took her IV bag off, threw it over her shoulder, and went out to her car to have a cigarette because she had to do that. I wanted to say, like, where were you a patient? How did that happen that you got out? I mean, I had a few minutes in my head saying, what, what, wait, wait. If we see someone going out the door with like two gowns on an IV bag over the, I'm sure she was telling me the truth uh, because the addiction was that strong. I mean, she just had to do it. I've had people tell me that they, we start an IV, great. They, they cap it off and leave. They have a line now for people that inject IV drugs. It's like, thank you very much. <laughs> this is really nice of you. And I'll see you later. I'm still leaving with my cardiac problems or whatever it is that I have related to the, related to the drug abuse. So those are risky things that they do to try to cope, which leads to disease and disability and that we live in that world. Uh, we're seeing the results of this in people that we, in people that we take care of. And early death. The ACE study's been running long enough that they know these things are true. So the CDC coupled with Kaiser Permanente, this is the slide about you know, what exactly happened here. Um, and they, did, they, looked, they watched 17,000 people for 10 years, looked at adverse childhood experiences, and then tracked them as they came back, right? And that's amazing. What a great thing to be doing. Look at the original study, because I'm sure you also have access to a good library here. Look at the original study, and then you'll see 50, 75 spin-offs of that original study that researchers have grabbed different pieces of it and analyzed it or redid it with special um, populations. And that's, this is what you see, what I'm telling you. Now think about the ACE population was what you're reading, white, does this matter? You bet. White, middle class, middle aged, that's who had Kaiser insurance, um, was financially well enough off to have Kaiser insurance. So this is the population that everyone wanted to believe doesn't have adverse experiences, but they did. Um, Two thirds of them had significant childhood traumatic experiences. There's only one third that said, no, none of these things ever happened to me. Amazing. So I just wanted to let you know that this is a big problem. And therefore, I'm confident with saying to you, you're going to see it. You are seeing it. OK, here's what you see. You see reminders of the past automatically activating certain neurobiological responses, and then you get these reactions and responses that are irrational, irrelevant, and can even be harmful to themselves 
So you see things like the symptoms that are listed um, below. Impulsive and aggressive, that's common in my world. That is, has to do with how people got incarcerated in the first place because they're impulsive and aggressive. And you need, a, you need a little story now to keep you with me. So I have a client, I'm still following her. The research piece of the three transition houses is following them after, after they leave. Her name is Michelle. I'm not gonna tell you anything else about her. I don't want you to know who, really who she is. Um, she has huge problems with impulsively being aggressive because that's what she's done her whole life. Um, if someone acts like they're gonna hurt her or in some way indicates they're gonna hurt her, she's gonna get in the first punch. That is who she is. So during her therapy, she learned to wear a rubber band around her wrist. Whenever she felt like hitting someone, she would just snap the rubber band. It was you know, working to some degree. What's supposed to happen in the transition houses is you cope with your issues, you, uh, get, a, you get your GED, you get an entry level job, nothing that's gonna support you, but let's start someplace. Uh, and as they're working their entry level job, they're picking up some kind of training for the next job. So Michelle is in their entry level job and it happens to be at McDonald's. So she doesn't like the manager. She tells me when she comes back every day, I really don't like this guy. And we talk about different ways that she can interact with this guy. It doesn't work. He threatens her verbally one day, bang. <laughs> Impulsive and aggressive, it's it's a real bear for some of these people. That's, that's their response. I'm gonna defend myself before you really hurt me because she's been there. Uh, I'm gonna hurt you. Self-injurious, we do have people that cut themselves. Uh, and maybe some of you have seen that and been puzzled by it. I was always puzzled by that one. What is that, why would you do that? It's, it's relieves anxiety. Um, and for the ladies in the, in the transition houses, they want to use, they miss the effects, they miss the life, they miss it. There are parts of it that they, enjoy is not the right word, but was familiar, was comfortable, was their world, right? And they miss it. So cutting is sometimes something they do, superficial cutting, so they won't use. They feel less anxious if they, if they do it. Anxious, yes, the whole population is anxious, um, and you work with anxious people, and there's all kinds of levels of anxiety. Um, you can th think now about when you see someone that's incredibly anxious, you know, what's happened to them? And what is the anxiety about? Could it be from experiences that they've had in the past? Is there a way that you can modify what you're gonna to do to decrease their anxiety? Of course they are. Moods disturbed, depression is very, very common um, with the populations that I, that I work with. Very, very common. Does everybody know what dissociation, dissociative symptoms are? No, I'm not talking about the three phases of Eve that dissociative identity disorder. I think we pretty much know that doesn't exist. Made a good movie, but that was kind of it for the science. What this means is that people learn, especially the folks who are having serial traumatic events, kids who've been sexually abused and it went on for years by someone in their family, their brother, their father, their stepfather. One of the ways they learn to cope is by dissociating. They're not there when it's happening. They're absolutely checked out, and they stay checked out during it, sometimes before it, when they know it's coming, and after it. And so what we see when it happened years ago one of that is that they use that coping skill, and they're missing <coughs> periods of time. Things don't go together when they're, you're trying to get a history because they were absolutely absent for some things you're asking them to recall. They simply weren't there. Um, a you and I version of this is when you're driving somewhere that you drive all the time, you get in the car and then you don't, you hear, you don't even know how you got here. It's like, wow, <laughs> was I in that car? Was I, I hope I did it well. I don't remember a thing about it, you know? <laughs> That's dissociation. You're doing it. Everyone's, everyone knows you're, you can see, you know, you're doing it. You were functioning, but you have no memory of what happened when you got there because you were someplace else. 
If you're driving the same boring drive every day, I think we all do that. Blowing up, freezing, you know what that means. Um, and a conditioned fear response. That means you see something, you hear something, you smell something, and it, and it triggers bringing you back to how it felt to be traumatized. I have learned, and there's literature to support it, that smelling is the one that lasts the longest. So if there was a particular smell associated with your traumatic experience, you had a parent who hit you on a regular uh, basis, called you all kinds of names. If there was a smell associated with that, it's really hard to erase. People work at trying to eliminate that smell in their lives because that's hard to get rid of. Okay. I think we've done this one. Traumatic stress, misinterpreted, misdiagnosed, and go untreated. So really, the take home uh, message for me is gonna be that you think about this. And if they don't give it to you on the first history, I'm not surprised. But if you're not someone who only sees people for a few minutes and then they're gone, you can see it in the few minutes. Uh, it's usually easier to see if you see people for a longer period of time, go back to it. Go back to it and try to figure out if this is related to trauma. The statistics say it is. And that's why you're seeing this behavior. Um, and it's not, it's not the kinds of, uh, I'll call it excuses, that I certainly gave to people about people over the years. We might unintentionally cause um, people to relive their trauma. And we don't want that because that's the pushing the wrong buttons thing. We don't want that. There's some place we're trying to go. We have probably limited time to do it in. Um, and we don't want them reliving the trauma because we know in the present can be just like they were experiencing the trauma and it's a little bit difficult to do whatever it is you're there to do um, when that's where the person is. So this is just a list of things. Um, you try not to humiliate people. I, I, I said when you were passing out the sheets, I know I've done that. I know I did it. You can think back on it and think, oh my. And I know I've been harsh. Is there something I had to do and they wouldn't let me do it? Whatever the thing was that I had to do, I was impersonal, disrespectful, I was all those things. Um, and as you're sitting there and looking at those things and doing a little introspection, do you see yourself doing those things? You know you've done them? It's in the interest of getting your day done. When somebody starts acting up. It's hard not to respond in, in one of these ways, to just try to get it done, whatever the thing is you're trying to get it done. Um, with traumatized folks, it doesn't work too well. <laughs> they will escalate. I don't know what happened to your person uh, before. I don't know what happened to your person before, but that escalated to a point where you were right. There was nothing you could do but try to diffuse it. You weren't going to get any information. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't going to happen. OK, so what I'm going to suggest you do that is helpful, um, this sounds, again, simple, but be kind. I've learned to always be kind, and it works. <laughs> if, uh, with folks who don't trust, and that is this population, they don't trust, you have to keep knocking on the door, and you keep knocking on the door. I don't mean a, a literal door. Um, with kindness, OK. Maybe they'll, they'll let you in just a little bit, you know? Um, it depends. But kindness consistently will make it helpful for that person to um, tell you what's going on and work with you. Because that's the ultimate goal, work with you on, we need to get here. If you're working in hospice, you know what, where this person is going. How can we get that person there? so that there's peace, there's some things we need to be working on in the weeks that we're together, so this death is much more peaceful than it could, than it would have been if I, I hadn't been there. You know, that's what you're looking for. What are the unresolved things in time? You can work on this stuff. Consistent kindness, more likely to 
um, respond to you. Patience, and that's hard because we work hard, and we have so only so many minutes that we can do these things. <laughs> Patience is difficult. So you might have to put off doing this thing you were going to do or do something else and come back when you have a, a little longer time frame. But you have to be patient as this person is trying to articulate to you what it is that you have to do. If we stay with your sexual abuse example, cause just because um, you just shared that, let's say the mission is that you need to catheterize a woman who's been, who's been sexually assaulted in the past by somebody, her brother, her father, her uncle, you know, whoever it was. It's going to be hard to do. So when you first suggest it, it's going to be no. Don't get near me. Don't touch me. I'm not having that. They'll have so they'll get very anxious. You can um, picture what go, what goes on there. So where you want to get, and it will take a little patience. So it won't take maybe as long as you think it will. Is how can we work? This needs to be done. Here's the reason. You must have a reason. If you don't have a reason for doing it, then you need to rethink. What am I? Why am I doing this? You have a reason to do it. Um, then you have to work with that person to say, now how can we do this? And that person will talk you through if you allow it. She'll tell you. Uh, what she can't tolerate. Maybe whoever abused her, I'm making this up, you know, laid her down, forced her legs apart. There was something he did and probably did it repeatedly and you're going to hit the button if you do anything close to that that takes her back to that experience. So together you'll figure out how can we get this done. Um, calm, that helps. If you can be calm, it would be, it would be helpful. Accepting of who they are, and listening. You can be doing things while you're listening. I'm really good at that. Are you really good at that? I don't think I'm quite as good at sitting in a chair and listen as I'm doing something <laughs> and listening. Whatever they've given me permission to do. I don't need to be doing the talking while I'm doing this thing. I know how to do it. Whatever the thing is, listen while you're doing it. You know, Pay attention to what they're, um, what they're telling you. And this is real rocket science, the last one. Say please and thank you a lot. It really helps. Such an easy thing. Say, can I please do this? And thank you when they were able to be cooperative about it. Give people as many choices as you can give them, even if they seem silly. I need to look in your ear. The person doesn't want you to look in their ear. I don't know. Maybe you got hit in the ear. I don't know where it's coming from. Well, this is why we need to do it. This is how I'm going to do it. This is the scope. This is what it looks like. Left ear or right ear? Where do you want me to start? <laughs> I'm going to look. Where do you want me to start? Where do you want to be sitting? I can give them choices about how to do this thing. Um, and you might get through it that way. And then say thanks. That wasn't too bad, we hope. OK. What we want to do is not inadvertently traumatize um, people. And what I'm saying to you is give them as much ability to participate in everything you do as possible. That's what you do with traumatized people. Try to make them feel safe. Try to make it feel like they have control. Make it feel like you're somebody they can talk to. And they can say to you, I'm afraid here. This makes me anxious. Whatever kind of words they want to, whatever words they can give you, the words are all over the place uh, in terms of what I, what I hear. And so, Give them as much control as you can possibly give them. These are people who have dealt with racism, in my world, powerlessness, uh, an overall lack of knowledge. And we don't have time to think about the Philadelphia school system. Uh, insensitive people. That's what they've been um, dealing with. And they've developed coping behaviors to these things. And we, as nurses, that's not our mission in life, but we just bump into this stuff and we get reactions that we, that we really don't want. So we're going to try really hard as nurses um, to not counter with aggression. We are not the correctional officers in, in prison. We're not going to put handcuffs on people, restrain them in some kind of way. That's not what we do. We try not to respond with something aggressive like that holding people down, try not to do that. That's our really last resort, um, trying to confine, confine people, um, trying not to be aggressive, not to be, um, not to be hostile. 
And the other one we do more often is we withdraw. This person's just a pain. And I don't like working with him or her, so we don't spend very much time in that room when really that's the room we should be spending more time in. Um, there'd be more of a difference afterward if we could get ourselves to do that. These folks are acting out their hurt with anger, with despair, with beliefs that don't make any sense to us. Um, they're acting out being treated unfairly. That's what, you're, that's what you're seeing. This is what they've seen. And they expect that you're gonna react in the same kind of, the same kind of way. Now, it doesn't always work to just be efficient and rational, which is what we learn in nursing school. It doesn't always work with these folks. So we've been talking about what you see now. Safety, very important, that they feel safe in the physical environment and as emotionally safe as we can make them. You can say things here. Set the stage, you can say things here. I'm not gonna be judgmental about it. You don't say that, you do it. It's okay for them to say things and your response is, is nothing or something positive or hmm. I've heard people say things like, yeah, you know, I've heard that before. Maybe that's, Maybe that's reassuring. For goodness sakes, in our intake, we ask people things like, do you have a bowel movement every day? Do you have to get up in the night to pee? Do you have sex with uh, men or women or both? You know, what do you use for, what's your safe sex practices? What do you use for birth control? We shouldn't be afraid of talking about sensitive things. We do it all the time. We do it every day. We are an audience that can hear these things and not be judgmental about it. We want to try to protect uh, project that so they feel safe in every way. If I say something to you, you're not going to hit me. You're not going to say something hostile back to me. Am I, am I making sense? I can trust you. OK. Um, I'll trust you. And part of how you get people to trust is that being kind and smiling and all that, and also being consistent so they know what to expect from you. When you come in, this is what you're going to say. Um, and you're going to explain things before you do them, you know, that you've developed at your build on this. If you see a person more than one time, um, you build on that you're consistent. This is how you do things, and these are how you do things together. And I've already emphasized choice a lot. And this is a collaborative thing. That's where the power comes from. This is them. This is their health. We're just here to help them. It isn't about us. It's about them. Give them all the power you can give them. Um, within our system, because let's be honest, our system is not designed to give people power. Our system is designed to just get people to do whatever it is we are telling them to do, because it's what's best for them. Heaven help me, because the latest research says this is what I'm supposed to be doing, so that's, that's what I'm doing, and you should be grateful that you're getting the best care possible at this institution. You gotta get rid of that. And one of these days we'll teach medicine. Okay. Reduce or eliminate any potentially reach traumatizing practices. I've kind of uh, talked about these a little bit. Secluding people, leaving them alone. They don't need to be alone and they sure don't need to be secluded. They can't intermix with anyone else. Um, restraints. The literature is very strong on you don't tie people down. Is, is that gone from this institution? You don't tie people down? Good. It's negative, whether you've been traumatized or not. The effects of that, you're lost control completely. You're somebody who has some issues trying to do that. Involuntary medication, I'm going to guess you don't do that either. Someone says no, that's it, right? OK, unless you can talk them into it. Doesn't mean you can't. Sometimes you can. Sometimes you can do that. And I've kind of mentioned the dynamics of re-traumatization via an example. That's that hitting the wrong button. You're doing something that triggers a response from them because something about what you did or said reminds them of something to do with their trauma. And bang, you're right in whatever their coping mechanism is. They're angry. They withdraw. You've talked about all different kinds of coping mechanisms. They're going to go right there. And we'd rather not do that. OK, so these are the things to think about that have to do with um, trauma-informed care. That's just a little diagram of all the pieces we've been talking about. 
um, understand the experience. We could do stories here for days of things I've heard. <laughs> Promote safety, earn trust. We haven't really talked about diversity but a very little bit, but that's important. Do your best to respect whatever it is in terms of diversity. And I, I, I genuinely believe we do that as nurses. We really don't care. You know, we're not big on judgments for, um, for, I hope we're not racist in any kind of way. We try not to be. Um, I would hope we're gender informed and all that. I would think we're pretty good on diversity. I hope so. It's something we all work on all the time um, to make sure that we don't have some kind of prejudice that we haven't recognized that we have. It's going to interfere with, a, um, with an interaction. Respect human rights, we certainly do that. Holistic care, meaning we take care of everything, um, not just whatever you're in here with your current boo-boo, whatever, you know, whatever, that, whatever that might be, sharing the power, being compassionate. This is all the stuff we've been this is the stuff we've been talking about, and that's usually the picture when somebody's talking about trauma-informed care. That's the um, that's the picture that people use. It doesn't say anything about respect, really, but respect is important in all of this. Trust. I keep saying it over and over again. And one other thing that I haven't mentioned that I do I do want to mention um, is the power of touch positively and negatively. We are one of the few professions that has permission to touch people. Most people, uh-uh. <laughs> so if you're someone who, most professions are not touching you, you don't want them touching you. We're touching all the time. So with people who've been traumatized and people who haven't, we need to be careful about that with the permission thing related to, related to touching. Not everybody wants a hug from you. There are some people that that's, that's a trigger. That's not a good thing. They don't want to be hugged. So I always say, can I hug you? <laughs> and then if I see the person again, I know whether it's an OK thing or a, or a not OK thing. We have the power to touch and touch in very intimate kinds of ways. Just respect that you have that. Um, and know that it's a double-edged thing. It's wonderful that we have the ability to touch people and we try to make people better by touching them. Um, but it can also do this thing we're talking about today, triggering um, some traumatic experiences um, for them. So, um, and this is another picture of what we're talking about, that what would be best is you think about this in screening when you're first talking to patients. They might tell you, they might not tell you. They might tell you a little bit, um, but it doesn't hurt to ask. Put it in that. Screen, those screening questions you ask something that gives them an opportunity to talk about adverse um, experiences, right? And creating that environment, that's what I try to do with the ladies in the, in the recovery houses. The environment matters because we can't take care of people if we're not safe. I, I've been a nurse a long time in a lot of different settings. Um, and there are settings I recall very clearly that I didn't feel safe. I really didn't. I didn't feel like the other people working there had my back. Um, I felt like there would be a monumental issue that would fall on me alone if there was a mistake made. I think the mistake would, would, would get to screaming. I knew it would, too. Um, would get to screaming if I made a mistake. I didn't feel safe. So if we don't create an environment in which we feel safe, then there's not a possibility of creating an environment where the patient feels safe. So logically, we have to work on what are our own prejudices that just sort of open that door. You have to think about it yourself. What are the things that trigger you? And work them through. Um, but also, you should be working in an area where Everybody's doing this. So the patients get feeling cared about, and the providers get feeling cared about. It's difficult for you to, it would be exhausting. I remember it being exhausting at the end of every day because the demand on me was so great. And I never really felt like there was any. Can you relate to that? Some of you? 
Most not, which is good. You must, you must be mostly in environments that feel pretty healthy, or you're not talking about it. You know, one or the, <laughs> one or the other. I, I would hope that we've kind of grown out of people screaming at you when you make a mistake, but I hear it, it still happens, at least in, um, in my world. You need to build that, uh, the foundation, it means you do your thing and everybody else does their thing. And one of the things you have to do, particularly people who do episodic care, is have a cadre of resources. Who can you call in a situation like yours? <laughs> who, can you, who have you got besides security guards? You know, who are your folks who could come to your rescue and know how to reach them? Um, who are the people that you could maybe refer this person to? Who would you like this person to see while they're hospitalized or after they go home, I mean, if you've started to develop a relationship with them, how would that this keep going after they leave you? Where would you like them to go? Um, you need to, it shouldn't just end with the hospitalization if there's a way that you can have them be uh, responded to someplace else after you would be really, really nice. Okay, now this is the beginning of talking about what Dr. Vanderkolk says um, how you treat this. And again, this depends a lot on your, on your um, setting as to how much of this can you treat. It depends on how long they're with you. Um, if it's only a few minutes, there's not a lot you can do beyond, beyond recognizing and trying to give them control over what it is you're trying to do at the moment, like start an IV, whatever it might be. If you have someone with you for a period of time, as the whole cadre of people that are working in hospice said, then you can try um, some of the things he found to be um, effective. Yoga, he mentions it on the tape. And the slide talks about different things related to yoga. Um, it, it significantly helps people stay focused and in the moment. And we want that. It's better for them that they can learn to stay focused in the moment. It's better for you if they can learn to stay focused and in the minute. So yoga. Do you have yoga here? No? No. Yes? You have a what? OK. But you're, that's probably for you as opposed to patients. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I've never been anywhere where they've tried to integrate yoga with patients. But research says it makes a difference. So it's somewhere to refer people if they're open to it um, to try having yoga treatments. I'm not going to go into exactly why the EMDR works, but it does. You need a, a counselor who's been trained to do the eye movement desensitization, and it has good um, effects, lasting positive effects after a fairly short period of treatment. So that's another phone number, card, something you want to keep in your pocket of where people can get uh, EMDR people who've been traumatized. And as with many things in the world of people's psyches and medications, eh, this helps, but for how long, we don't really know. You give people medication, but is that going to do it for the rest of their lives? Unknown. I think it depends on the complexity of your uh, mental health mixed with the um, addiction and whatever else is going on here. Um, this is the new buzzword, mindfulness. Um, and it's effective. This is the one I'm trying with the ladies who are in jail, the behavior unit. You use breath and body movement. Um, focus on gaining a sense of physical control over yourself. That's what you're, that's what you're doing. So you're trying to make yourself feel safe and to some degree powerful and the ability to protect and defend yourself. That's what mindfulness, um, that's what mindfulness is. Although I didn't introduce it to the ladies that way, and I think you can understand why I wouldn't. Um, I, I introduced it to them saying that I know they're living in a very stressful situation, because they are. Where it's noisy all the time, the lights are on all the time, and I do mean all the time. The noise level on those units, unbelievable. And it's 24-7. And lights are on all the time, and people are telling you what to do, and it's very stressful. So I, wanted to, I want to try to teach you something 
that can help you cope with those stresses is how I introduced it, because that they could buy, not this. And they're doing it in their, in their cells. Pretty neat, huh? Just, they just want to shut it out sometimes. They're dealing with whatever their case is. It's just a lot. So they, they're, they were willing to learn a way to uh, be just with themselves and in the moment. And this is, that's the way that works. This is here, you probably know this. This is old. You've read it before. Um, the stages of change, just to make the point that they're not going to get from A to S or T or U, where you're hoping they're going to get to uh, very quickly. If you see people over a period of time, you have some hope of moving it some in some direction. If you're seeing someone one time or two times, a very short period of time, you're probably not going to get too far. Changing behavior is really, really difficult. And I think, I hope, everybody in the room knows that. There's people in here who, who quit smoking. Yeah? It was really hard. I didn't have that one, but everybody tells me it's really tough. The ladies who use heroines tell me the cigarette's harder. I don't know. That's what they tell me. <laughs> Can't give up the cigarettes. The heroin, OK, we'll work on that. Cigarettes, no. Not giving that up. Um, anybody who's tried to lose weight. It takes time. You have to move through all these phases. You have to think about it. You have to think about it. Then you have to decide to do it. And then you have to make some kind of a plan. We, as nurses, jump right to this is what you should do because this is the right thing to do. And you don't need to have a history of trauma to have that not work. But that's how they told us to do it. And this is what you're supposed to be doing. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Write it all down. Spell out how to do it. Um, it's never going to work. Try to, this is, again, this is where you want to get. You want this person to be able to change your own dressing every day in between visits. Um, so that's where you want to go. So start thinking about getting that person ready to do that, and then what's the, what's the vehicles? How are you going to make that happen? All these things. And then to get them to keep doing it. Um, have you seen this before? Yeah. Some of you, maybe all of you. Don't expect um, that you're going to get too much on a one-time encounter. You get through the situation, whatever the situation is, uh, nobody, nobody suffering for it. You did, pre you did pretty well. You're trying to deliver services that are effective, that are efficient, that are timely, that are respectful. I loaded the slide, didn't I? That are person-centered, um, that takes that person into consideration and recognize that you and other people working on your team also have histories of trauma. So that's that trying to develop an environment where everybody feels safe. You'll be a much more effective worker um, if, it, if it feels um, safe for you. And you know that if you get in a difficult situation, then you know people are gonna, people are gonna be there for you. I personally think we should have our own professional counselors that just deal with nurses. Because we have issues other people just don't have. Um, and that's part of the privilege. People let us into their lives. They let us touch them. They, they tell us their secrets. They, we are in a different space than most, than most people. And so I think we deserve somebody who understands that if we have a need for something we need to work on or personal selves. It'd be nice if we had counselors that only work with nurses. I don't know any, but it's just an idea that I have that that's what we really need to do, have somebody we can work on things with. You know, we've had a day where you've heard a lot of really bad things. It'd be nice to have a sensitive person to talk to them, to talk to them about. And maybe that cropped in my head today because yesterday um, was my first death from the transition houses. In the three years I've been doing this, nobody died till yesterday. And it hurts. Because I know her. We worked really hard with her. She got to the point of she moved out. Um, she had her own, she had a room. It wasn't really a, wasn't really a uh, place to stay. She didn't have, she didn't have children. She had a room, she was working a job and, and you know, doing pretty well. 
I told you, I do keep in touch with them. And then about two weeks ago, I was in uh, Brown City Hall because I had a meeting in one of the buildings next to City Hall, and I saw her right by the where you go down to get the trolley or the subway. Um, and she looked really bad. And she had all of her stuff in a pull-along grocery kind of thing. If you live in the city, you drag these things to the grocery store and put all your bags in there and you drag it back, it's on wheels. And she had a bunch of stuff in there which tells me she's living in a shelter. And so I said, you know, how are things gone? Oh, she said, everything's fine. I'm just doing this temporarily. Uh, you still getting your methadone? Yep, I could tell she was really high on more than methadone. I can talk to her for a while, waiting for her to say, can I come back? She never said it. She just kept going with that she was really fine. And I could tell she was not really fine. And then I heard yesterday she, she had all, numerous drugs in her system. And we lost her. That's our first, my first loss from the houses. And it feels really bad. Because I'm going over that again and saying maybe I should have pushed her a little harder. Maybe I should have said, please come back. I, I hear what you're saying, but you don't look like you're doing well. But I, I, I didn't. I followed my own principles, waited for her. I didn't. And we lost her. It's just tough. OK. So we want to be all these things. So that wherever it is you're working, it's safe for everybody. It's trusting for everybody. It's healing for everybody. Not many of us have um, traumas of our own um, that we sh that we need to be in an environment where people are at least aware, not specifically about what the trauma is, but that you have issues about certain things, certain things you need somebody to have your back on, whatever those things are, until you, until you can work them through. So this is what Matt was trying to say in the beginning of this talk, um, that unlike many other talks I've given where I'm trying to bring uh, a group of people up to date on the latest science, here's the latest science on this, and this is the specific thing you should be doing with these specific patients, because we used to think this, but now we think this. <laughs> um, this is not like that. This is something that can create sustainable change with everybody you encounter. It's not a specific group of people. It's everybody. That, you, that if you do some of these things that I'm suggesting that sound so really simple, giving people control and doing your best not to be judgmental, even though you know it's pushing some of your buttons, and you want to you, you're scared that you're presenting some kind of nonverbal, that, that you don't have any respect for that, whatever the thing is they're telling you that they do. But you weren't there. You didn't experience their trauma. This is the coping skill they have, whether we're talking about promiscuity or smoking cigarettes or whatever we're talking about. That's it. Don't judge it. Just try to help them uh, move past it. That's sustainable change. Remember that. Ace thing that I introduced, what we don't want is people to follow that pyramid and die early. That's not good. We see them moving on the, up that scale, right? Doing risky things. Yes? Uh, you could use just a moment of levity. So here it is. In Newark, everybody knows where Newark is. If you're going to the Newark airport, it's very important that you don't get off before the airport because you'll be in Newark. It's not a good place to be. <laughs> And in New Jersey, the, the getting cigarettes from someplace that doesn't tax them and reselling them is very lucrative. And the punishment is very minimal in New Jersey. You might get fined. I mean, you're not doing time, um, as the guys talk about it, for, for selling, cig selling cigarettes. You, should, you shouldn't be doing that. Um, OK. So the police in New Jersey, they told me the story. The police in New Jersey are trying to crack this ring, of, that's what they called it, of people who are selling um, cigarettes that they got from, I think, an Indian reservation, if I remember it correctly. It had no tax on it. And they were selling it for less than market value, lots of cigarettes. They wanted to find who these people were that were doing that. Um, and how they found them is they were just sitting and watching 
and they saw two very young people in the front of a car, and in, in the front seats, and an elderly gentleman in the back seat. The car is what made them look a little bit closer, and no, everyone had a seatbelt on, and they knew that was it. No one wears a seatbelt in Newark. It's a very risky neighborhood. A seatbelt is your last thought. Who cares about a seatbelt? You know, you could get shot any time. Let's, you know, let's focus on the big stuff. A seatbelt? Are you kidding? So all three people had a seatbelt. They were like, "That's it," and it was. And it was. <laughs> they were trying to act normal. <laughs> I got him caught. Okay, so by now, I think you're pretty convinced on, um, at least I hope, on the benefits of this. You should be taking care of each other, and if you do, then it improves the quality of the services that you can provide because you're better. Reduce those negative encounters. Try not to push any buttons. If you can know a little bit about what happened to them, that'll help you know which buttons not to push. Clearly, if somebody tells me they've been chronically sexually abused, I have some pretty good ideas, at least where to start and things that we should have going to have to work on negotiating, right? Um, or if I know they've been, they were uh, malnourished as children, I've met those, I've met those people. People who tell me they never had enough food in the house and they remember standing on the biggest sibling's shoulders to be pushed in through the window to steal food from somebody's kitchen because they didn't have food. Um, and stealing shoes from the pool because they didn't have shoes. So when other kids were swimming, they took their, they took their shoes. I mean, I've heard all kinds of things, all kinds of things. So when you know a little bit about that, then you know it'll give you a little direction of how you can, how you can, this person's gonna have big issues with trust, right? But it's gonna take a little while to get somewhere um, in terms of that. And. As Liz said about me, yes, I, I, I'm very into let's give people hope. That's what the commutation thing is about. Um, that's what the, that's what the, um, the uh, recovery homes are about, to give people that nobody had hope for hope. People that felt hopeless, people that felt completely discarded. The great part about the work is um, seeing them succeed. I'm really learning along the line that people you would think don't have talents and abilities. They have talents and abilities, amazing. They've just never tapped them because the trauma overrides everything else. Just trying to get through the day is all they can do. So they don't have, they can't reach their full potential unless you help them. And first of all, they have to believe in themselves and, and have some hope that they can get there. Does that make sense? Okay they can be well, that they can re recover, that they can be successful. You know, every person who moves out and gets her own place, you know, she's, she's, she's on her way, okay? And I do think your environment needs to be healthy for us to be able to be healthier with the, um, with the patients and do all the things that I'm suggesting. I'm still using the word patient. I like that word. What do you guys use? Client? Makes me think of a lawyer. I can't quite do that. OK, there, um, this is just things that are being worked on now. We're coming to the end of my talk here. Uh, this has this pieces about this um, have been published. Child abuse, we need to do something about it. You're seeing the after effects of children and adolescents being abused and how they behave as, as adults. Just take a read through here. This is what the researchers, I'm just combining a whole bunch of stuff and putting it together here in a slide, believe that if we could find a way to eradicate child abuse, this is what we'd be reducing. Wow. Wow. So when the mayor of Philadelphia said, I haven't met him yet, but we have a date. Uh, when the mayor of Philadelphia said uh, he was going to do preschool, he was going to use the money off the soda tax so that um, children who wouldn't get preschool would get preschool, I was all for it because it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity. That's a great idea. Now, now he needs a little help with what it's going to look like. 
and how he's gonna how he's gonna staff it. I believe in nurses. I think nurses can lead all these things. Um, I heard you have a sexual assault program here. That's great. Um, what I've done in Philadelphia is now everybody in Philadelphia, everybody, I mean everybody, who doesn't require hospitalization, who reports a sexual assault and is medically stable, is seen in an outpatient center by nurses. Because really the deal about sexual assault was we wanted to take care of people because that's what we do we do it very well um, the police could by the by get what they needed and we would collect evidence for them because that's what they want that's not why I'm there <laughs> to get swabs I'm there because this person needs help and I want to be first and it would take a long time to tell you how that was accomplished but it's done and it's working, right? Children go someplace else, but all the adults go to one place. And it's all nursing and it's great. So let's take this one too. Remember what Claire Fagan said. Okay, there have been people doing work on the economics of, of if they could eradicate child abuse. It would create tremendous savings. So what's been written about, you can find these things if you want that make a difference. And the bottom line, which is money, home visits. A couple of you sounded like you do home visits. They've, they're not currently the in thing to do. <laughs> we need them back. They worked. They worked. For those of you who are still doing it, I'm proud of you. It works. You're in their environment. You can see what they're dealing with to try to figure out how we can solve some of their problems. You're in their setting. Um, we need to bring them back as much as possible. It might cost more in the short run, but it's sure saving you a lot in the, in the long run. Daycare, make it better. Preschool, I've already tooted that horn. And your workplace can be more efficient and, and uh, more effective if we can deal with whatever our traumatic events are. So I'm going to end with what I started with. Um, try to imagine a healthcare setting where these things change. Um, but instead of thinking to yourself, what's wrong with this person, or even saying it to the person, what's wrong with you? It's only a small needle. Look, it's just this big. What do you, what do you, what do you think I'm coming at you with this giant thing? Instead of doing that, you ask in a nice way what happened to you. Understanding past traumas and know that it comes back in the present if you trigger it. It never goes away. Committed to supporting people as they heal. It's a long trajectory. Think about those stages of, of change. It's a long, and they're not going to change overnight, but being supportive of people when they're going in the right direction. You know, celebrate if they tell, if you suggest to them they go for some yoga or mindfulness sessions and they do it and they come back and tell you about it, wow, you know, that's better than a birthday party. You should have cake, something. And leaving people feel empowered. The system needs to move in that direction, in my opinion. It would be utilized much more effectively than it is now. If people felt like when they came here, we would be empathetic and we would be caring and we would share power with them. We have it. It's your body though, it's your life. Let's do this together. It would make a huge difference. So I'm going to do my best. It's not quite as relevant as it could be. And before I get going with, with what I came to talk about today, I just wanted to let you know a little bit about myself. I am a person who survived childhood sexual trauma. And I started doing the work to be well when I was about 19, 20 years old. And I'm 57, so if you do some math, it was in the beginning processes where what we did was a lot of screaming. Primal therapy, I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, but it's where you were encouraged, as Dr. Brown had indicated, there are places where you're very bottled 
And there is, of course, a lot of anger or rage that's associated. So you're encouraged in a group setting to elbow down. How do you feel? I'm mad. No, how do you feel? And by the time you're done, whether you're actually feeling it or not, you're screaming. And that was the beginning, and that really upset the central nervous system, which I don't think we knew about then. And so over the course of time, I learned new strategies. And my first one was an elective yoga class when I was in college, where that person said and encouraged this stillness thing. And I tend to lean towards, like, you know, shaking legs or that kind of jittery kind of thing. So it took a while. And then there was this space. But there was also, alongside of it, that nervousness. So I had to keep moving forward. I kind of set that aside because I felt the volcano underneath. I'm someone who grew up knowing I didn't lose all of the memories. So they were with me as I moved through school, grade school, high school, college, work life. And then I got to that place where there's some hidden memories. And Fortunately, as I learned to resource myself, I leaned into that. But some of it came through the cancer story. While I was developing myself, I fit into, this is taking longer than I thought. Anyway, while I was developing myself, I worked in an ER because one of the things that you find statistically to be true is that you're really good at chaos and managing there. And so I worked in an ER and had the best friendships ever for 17 years. And our humor is often misunderstood, so it can only be shared among ourselves. But what a, what a gift humor is. And the places that I've trained now, I've got a couple 200-hour trainings, one with the Chopra Center, one with Shivananda. And then I went back to the ashram again for another 30 to 40 day stint and got a 500 hour. I found I rest yoga nidra with Richard Miller, who I'm, I'm very curious about what the conversation between Bessel would look like and Richard. I feel I can say Bessel now because I also did a training with Justice Institute out of Boston where he was one of the educators. You know what's like that though? that falling feeling, hearing you have cancer. Hearing you have cancer is very much like that. And then put yourself in being the person who's experienced sexual trauma. So the ground that I was on was already sort of cracking, because I had been doing some work, a lot of work actually, and then I hear I have cancer. And I was falling. I had no idea what I left behind now. Anything that I was working on was just going to be in that place. And now I'm in this, this fall where I don't have any answers at all. And you can imagine that when I first heard that, my breath was very short. It might have been that it was just below the collarbones. And I remember the day that I received the diagnosis, because I had some signs, and I, and I was a regular person for, for the gynecology visits. And I knew, just based on the doctor's response as I was there in that most vulnerable of positions, something was up. And I heard with her in a very short order. She told me when she would be calling me, and I made sure that I was at work. Because the people who would hold me up we're going to hold me up. And I, that's where I first heard that word. You have cancer. And we need, to, we need to have you come in right away. So I bring family for that, because what happens when you're in that place where your mind is now overwhelmed, your breath is short, and someone's going to be telling you they have a life plan for you. 
When I look back on that memory, this is what I hear. Do you ever do like the Charlie Brown voices? Like everybody just, I don't remember too much of what was said. But there was a plan. And the plan was, we are going to do a radical hysterectomy. When you're done with surgery, you'll heal. You're going to receive radiation and chemotherapy. All done. OK. Great. There's a plan. There was a plan as I'm falling. And surgery day comes. One of the things that I learned from surgery day was that my humor rate actually carry me. And I remember it being a little awkward and uncomfortable, because every time I had to go to the bathroom, for some reason that I couldn't explain, I had gotten a tattoo the week before my diagnosis. I was never going to do that. Never. And then I realized, <laughs> I realized why. I, had, I got an angel put on my back. And so it became really significant that, oh, an angel's got my back. So there was this leveling of emotion there. But I didn't want my mom to know. <laughs> I'm a grown woman. So every time I had to go to the bathroom while waiting, I did this little awkward thing and walked to the bathroom, which I'm pretty sure my sisters knew at the time and were getting a little bit of a giggle for it. I don't know. I recreate memories that are more fun. <laughs> but the gentleman comes to take me into surgery. And I awkwardly move myself on, so I'm not exposing anything for reasons other than that I was naked underneath that gown. And he starts to carry me, you know, wheel me away. And we get to the place where he's pressing the, the button on the wall, and I'm feeling a little panicky. And it's the And we're rolling. I decide to give a look back. But I notice that there's green tile on the, on the ground. And I remembered the movie, The Green Mile. Anybody? Familiar with that, right? And all the insensitivity when people are being put to death, dead man walking. So I see green tile. And by the way, the anesthesiology thing that you have to sign off on, when death is listed as a side effect, can we call that a consequence? Because <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's a little bit more. But that comes into my mind as I'm seeing the green tile. and. I look back and I'm like, green tile. Sure hope it works out better for me than John Coffey. And the doors close. I had such a kick out of that. In my recreation of the memory, it was my mom's face going. And then looking at my sister for an explanation, pretty sure she got it, and then had to explain. Mom, she was just kind of referring to hoping she lives. And every time I recreate that memory, I hear mom saying, well, that's just not funny. <laughs> it's just not funny. I come out of surgery. I lived. No side effect of death. And in that moment, when I'm coming out of the drugged part of surgery, I open my eyes. And it's a little bit like one of those after school made for TV movies. I don't know if I'm dating myself again, but there's always this beginning. Kids get themselves in trouble, and there's this peak and drama, and then you know it guides you into this happy ending. Well, as I'm waking up, I'm feeling that I'm at the peak of my story. Because I see my daughter. And my daughter is passionate and fiery and not shy about trucker language, not quick to tears. But she comes over to me as she notices I'm awake, and she grabs my hands. And I see that she's crying. I'm like, huh. Oh. Things are starting to get back online. And I look up, and I see, oh, my son and my sisters. Like, these people are all in my room. I didn't expect that. And, my brother-in-law, that's really sweet. And my ex-husband, 
<laughs> and my best friend. So I'm like, oh, hi, you guys. Why is Lizzie crying? It was my biggest concern. Why is she crying? And someone's voice in my memory, I hear, hang on, honey, we're going to go get the doctor. OK. So now I'm that part in the fall, things starting to get up online, where it's like, you got a plan B? I'm feeling the plan B. And my drugged breath, I am a little certain, was less than full. And Dr. Boulay comes in, someone who's on your staff here. I love that man. When you have the demeanor, he steps into a room filled with family. This is, this is our drama. He holds the whole room and me and gets close enough that I know that he's talking to me and he's also addressing my family. And he tells me, plan B. OK. So we got in there, and the tumor was too big. The cancer had spread. So we really had to just close you up. And here's what we're going to do next. Got to shrink the tumor, have a different kind of radiation, and of course, chemo. OK, let's get started. Let's get started with plan B. Here's where I'm going to take a small break in the story to give you another breath to lean into. Because the next one triggered a memory for me. And it's useful to share because you might be in that position when you're around someone like that. OK. So Matt told me that that's actually me. I don't ever remember dreads or sword. But I'll take it. <laughs> While I was in this position of embracing new things, I also had to walk side by side with my trauma. And at some point, and I don't know where it is on the timeline, because you might remember that one of the things trauma does is remove us from timelines. Because we don't process with words. We process with these random sort of emotions that come in, triggers like smells that Dr. Brown referred to, places, paint color, maybe some white coats. Somebody, and I wish I remembered who, at some point said, just look at the word cancer. It removed some of that fear that I had around the word and what it could possibly mean. And there it said, see, answer. So I had this window of opportunity where I could use this diagnosis, this health event, as a way to heal. I liked that. That gave me some power. And I did. I forged forward with my eyes and my heart as wide open, which was safe. Oh, yeah, there's the part about the laughter thing. OK, we'll go right past that. Here's, here's a lesson in breath where we're going to go a little deeper with where we take it in our lungs. So it, and this is something that you, I hope, can use when maybe you have 30 seconds to use the restroom. You can go into the bathroom. Maybe you have to explain yourself because you'll be breathing full and complete. Maybe you have, so you're there by yourself, and maybe you don't care to explain yourself. You're resourcing. And the more you learn to resource yourself, the more you'll resource your patients. Because of those, remember, there's those mirroring neurons. So when you're in that place where maybe someone's not in control of what's going on for all of their reasons, you're the one thing that they're looking at. OK, so the breath. This one's taught in. It's a yogic breath, and it's a full and complete one. The first one that we did this morning was a belly breath. And we really just stopped, dropped the diaphragm and let the air come to the base of the lungs, contracted, and moved it out. This one uses all of the lungs. 
And so if you need something to look at, this is a visual. I'll talk it through first, if that's OK. And then if you want, you can listen to the sound of my voice. You can choose to close your eyes. You can choose to have them halfway closed, whatever you find comfort in. So when you breathe in, again, you relax the diaphragm so that the base of your lungs has some room. And it helps to bring your body upright so that there's room for expansion. Sometimes people will take a deep breath, and when, especially children, when I do the work with the kids and after school programs, OK. Well, good job moving your shoulders. Let's try something else. So there's the attention to and awareness of your shoulders so that when the next the base is filled, the chest will expand. And then you watch the breath come to just below the collarbones. And you can pause if you like, if a pause is comfortable to you. And then when you exhale, you can track the muscles of your belly until it's all expelled. It was OK to move, right? You've been sitting for a while. So I'm going to turn that down just a bit. If you want to listen to the sound of my voice, to give yourself a practice. You might be in your feet first. And the invitation is there for you to open or close your eyes halfway. It is your choice, whatever makes you more comfortable. But notice your feet. As you've been outward, you've been listening. So now bring it back into towards you. Notice your hands and where your hands are resting. There's no right or wrong way for any of this. It's just noticing. So maybe you notice some tingling in the palms of your hands or fingers. And maybe you're bring your body into a position that supports a full breath. We do this thing called a cleansing breath sometimes, just to prepare the mind. It's an inhale and an exhale through the mouth. I'm invited to do that if you like. ready to begin that full breath, inhaling through the nose, exhaling through the nose, inhale the belly drops, chest expands, exhale the muscles of the abdomen contract, expelling all Tracks. Inhale, belly rising. Exhale, belly contracts. And it's that full and complete breath. The belly rises, the chest expands. You see the air land to below the collarbones. And it's expelled from the belly. Staying with your breath, keeping the eyes closed, the body centered, your focus inward. And whenever you're ready, if you've needed a nap and you feel like staying where you are, that's good. You can do that.
I'm going to let you know about the next part of my journey. So plan B. Part of plan B was that I was going to be in the hospital for 48 hours. This was in an effort to shrink this apparently larger one than what they thought tumor. 48 hours, immobilized, with my legs in that very vulnerable position, and then radioactive balls inserted into my vagina. Yeah, right? That took my breath away. And there will be places in some of the places that I spoke about medication as it related to women or men who have been traumatized. They get on this early track of, oh, he or she is hysterical. Let's give them whatever medication that brings that down. Not a fan of that. When I was in that hospital, I had a pump. And I was really happy. So I, I stand corrected that there are times when pharmaceutical truly is a friend of mine. That was one of them. And it was all I could do was to just get through that. That was it. That was my, that was my job, my mission, shrinking the tumor. My son made a mixtape of all of the music from all of the movies we had seen together. And it was actually something we talked about beforehand. And he literally performed one of the songs that he knew I would enjoy. I wish now that I had brought that one. So that was something that soothed me as I experienced that moment in time. And I have to say that the nurses who came in, drugged or not drugged, they were wonderful. There wasn't an unkind person that came near me. It was wonderful. But of course, then I'm discharged, and I'm sent home. And Bessel van der Kolk has a book called The Body Keeps the Score. It's not easy reading, but it's useful if you wanted to continue understanding a trauma body and a trauma brain. And having my legs up like that triggered a body memory. And indeed, there was a point in my history where my le I was restrained. And what I noticed when I noticed that that was alive in me, I called my sister Kate, who's a skilled therapist. And I let her know that this was happening, and I, I had no idea what to do with it. This was happening. I, every time I thought about it, I was contracting. Whatever she was doing, she stopped doing it, and she came to my house. And at the time, it was, I was enjoying some outdoor weather. So, and being inside still felt too constricting. The whole of it was overwhelming. And appreciate that. If you were in front of someone who didn't have a process, and now they tapped into that memory, and you're the one who's the person putting someone in stirrups, you might have gotten that, what the are you doing? I frankly would prefer if you didn't do that. That might have been what you absorbed. But I had a process, so it went a different way. And she came up to the driveway, and she got out of the car, and she was carrying this little like, lawn ornament, uh, uh, some sort of particle board dude with his hand out for a flower pot to go on. You know, like sometimes you see like, the one with the little boy peeing and the little girl covering her eyes, like those. But, and it was that. I'm like, what is that? She's like, I don't know. Bill brought it home. He doesn't know why. But I think I figured out why, because neither one of them liked it. So there it is at, at outside. And we started doing a little process where I didn't need to be encouraged to say how angry I was. And I wasn't just processing for myself at this point, because I realized the same thing had happened to my sisters. 
And it just grew and it grew and I looked around and I found a hockey stick because you know, I coached field hockey and there was always something around. So I grabbed that and I started wailing on this little, little butler. <laughs> and he fell down. So I went in the house and I grabbed masking tape and I, that didn't work and that, so I got rid of that and I found duct tape. And it's true, duct tape's stronger. So I taped it to the swing set. And that little guy, who was supposed to be holding a flower pot, served another purpose. It was perfect. I was able to take that moment and heal. I had that opportunity to take the cancer story, integrate it with my trauma story, and move on to the next thing. Three cheers, right? That was a good thing. Well, it wasn't over yet. The whole story was not complete yet. Now we had to figure out what to do with radiation. And that part of the story was affected by what happened in the operating room for the first go around. They took the omenum from my intestines, cropped them up inside of me, with good intention for that being the thing that kept me from having to eventually have a, a bag. Right? They were going to protect that. Well, at the time, that wasn't thick enough. That omentum wasn't thick enough, so it dropped. And I had scores of situations that happened as a result of that. Lots of hospitalizations from obstructions. Lots of people coming to my bedside to take care of all of those things. I was blessed because the people taking care of me were people that I worked with. So I worked at Lehigh Valley Hospital on 17th Street. So every admission, there was a familiar face. Some people aren't that lucky. Clearly, that was a golden moment for me. I didn't have to worry. And I always had my advocate there. People don't have advocates either, right? Except now you have nurse navigators is great. Here's the part where I want to remind you that you might be that person. The people that Dr. Brown takes care of, they don't have family that ties them and shows up for them. You're it. So in that moment when there's flailing or inappropriate language or repeat behavior and you're on your 12th hour of work, and that's what's in front of you. Breathe. Because you're it. When you go home at night, breathe. Take care of you because you're the one. You're the one. It's a, it's a job that you may not have realized you were signing up for, but you're the one. Jump back into the radiation story. I end up with a really great woman who was going to do her best, even though the, the intestines were dropped now and we had to worry about that. She was going to set me up so that the targeted machine that was going after the tumor went to just that. So knowing that I couldn't just lie flat on a table for that to happen, she thought perhaps that she would use wedges and pillows. And I felt in that moment more of the body keeps the score coming up. And I let her know, listen, I wasn't big into talking about it at that time other than just a little, a little information. I said, I'm also working with this sexual trauma. And I'm not sure how this is going to go. OK. She was, OK, I'll keep that in mind. So at one point, I was face down with my buttocks hanging up in the air, while about three or four other people behind the glass were having a conversation without a whole lot of presence to what happened next. There were tears. And I couldn't get off of that hard table quick enough. 
She was wonderful in that she heard my story. I was now off the table in the corner with tears. And again, when I recall things, it's imperfect. But when I recalled this particular moment, there was a lot of time that seemed to go past. There were three people, I remember three people, and they were still looking at their machine. And I was crumbling. So in that moment, I am certain when I revisit it, and if they knew it now, because I knew that they cared, that is not in question, but that task was important. And I could have used that moment where one came out, said, oh, can I, what do you need? Water, hold your hand, something like that. So if you see tears and you're about to be on that mission-driven path, you're the one. Take that moment to be with a person who's tearful. Sometimes it only takes 10, 15 seconds. That's all that's necessary, is I'm here. I recognize your pain. And as soon as you're ready, we're going to go forward. And that brings me to another point that Dr. Brown brought up about the, thing, the please and the thank you. There's this other thing that comes out really strong in the studies that Dr. Vanderkolk did, and that was that people who didn't have choice need it. So when I could no longer do that, be with my tail end hanging up in the air, I then had a choice. And I said, I, I won't be able to do that. If I, need it, if I get a bag, I get a bag. There's no way I was going to do three times a week like that. It wasn't going to work. So in your work with patients, ask them. It's as simple as left ear or right ear. Do you think this is going to work for you? I see that you need to be moving around a little bit. Do you want to get up? It's OK if you walk around. I can see when I get closer, that's a problem. I'm going to stay right back here for a minute. And you tell me when you're ready. If I have something to do, I'm going to go back. But then I'll come back. So any time that you say or offer a choice, you're now minimizing whatever's going on in that trauma brain and that trauma body. And I know that that's one of the biggest and hardest things in healthcare is time. Because you've got lots of patients, lots of tasks, ERs. It's, I get it. From what I've seen, and from some of the people that I've been with, 15 seconds of a choice saves two minutes of trying to convince. So you might just experiment with that. So we always do a little bit of movement first, and then and then settle into some mindfulness. And the one day I, it'll be the, the thing that we do after this, but the one day I did a mindfulness one where they had to create, or encouraged to create, a safe place. And it was a thing where we wanted to introduce their connection to compassion. So I had them get on a hot air balloon. It was about three minutes. These things don't take long. And from a distance, see who you love. And see that working out for them. And how does it feel to really love them? And what, do you, what is the thing that you want most for them? And feel all of that. And then have them notice how it feels to be in their body with all of that love and compassion. And I'm thinking the whole time, this is a great thing. <laughs> I forgot about ab reactions. And we turn on the light, and the first little guy, fifth grade, starts talking. He's always, always the first one. He's clearly a young man who's had some therapeutic words in his life. And he starts talking about his dad. And he starts to cry. I'm like, and he tells me, and the class, 
part of the story. And at some point he's like, Miss, can I talk about it later? Of course. And then he shares later. He comes back after he moves on. And I, I had to move this class of crying kids because now were you ever in a room where like one kid throws up and then five of them do? It happens when they cry too. He's crying. The little girl next to me starts crying. I said, are, are, are something OK in your world? No, I just really, he's my friend. He came to me later and said, his dad was a drug addict. And his family was very faith-based. And he was always asked to pray. And he did. And his dad turned it around. And his dad's working. And in that moment of being still and seeing and feeling his dad, he was overcome. He was just overcome and needed hugs. And it was a beautiful moment. And then we had to pick up where we left off with the other five who were crying. <laughs> but it happens. OK, back to your chocolate. Nobody ate it, right? We're going to see how your, <laughs> we're gonna see how your resolve was. All right, consider that this is a mindful moment. So notice that your feet are on the floor. And you have a piece of unwrapped chocolate in your hand. It's all going inward now. You're starting to reflect again. And you can take a look at it. And maybe just notice what's happening in your mouth as you contemplate chocolate. And maybe what's going on with thoughts. Maybe there are some thoughts that are coursing through your brain parts. You might have a few words for me for making you wait longer. Just notice that. And tap into what's happening with your body breathing. Just notice that your body's breathing all by itself. You don't have to do any work. And then with the opposite hand, you can start unwrapping that chocolate but real slow. See if slow happens. I know that when I was eating lots of chocolate, those little pieces of paper never worked. And when you get the chocolate out, maybe put it in the palm of your hand, curling up the silver wrapper. And what does it feel like? to have the silver wrapper. So in one hand is the chocolate, and the other is the wrapper. You can put that in your pocket or in some place that's not littering. And now bring that chocolate up to your nose and just smell. And notice what's going on inside as you smell chocolate. I know my mouth is watering. And now, put that chocolate on your tongue and let your tongue retreat into your mouth, but don't chew. Let it rest on your tongue for a moment. And notice what happens now. Notice if you're salivating, if you have ideas about what kind of cruel person I might be. And then go ahead and chew to your heart's content. Now what I suggest after this is when you go home, another caretaking moment, or any time that you eat, before you take your first bite, take three full and complete breaths. Before you take your first bite. Now that doesn't take long. But now you're setting your body in such a way that digestion can happen without a lot of interference, right? So three full and complete breaths. And then your first bite, 
See if you can chew at least 12 times before you swallow. Now, when I suggested this to that same class, I heard things like, yo, my family's going to think I am crazy. I can't do that, miss. And I did have some kids back who actually did this homework. And they said, yeah, my mom asked me if I didn't like it. Or what's taking you so long to eat? I'm not sure if he did the education part for his family. I suggested that he might do that. And then notice when you take the second bite, if you can keep that same sort of consciousness to your eating, anytime you have a chance to practice being mindful to the moment you're in, it's not like you have to sit down and meditate for an hour. That practice done repeatedly creates in you the ability to be in front of that person that's freaking out. Now you've got, it's, you've got a body that's familiar. Oh yeah, I know what to do. You might notice that a level will rise in you of being excitable. But now you've practiced. And you can breathe again. And you can be that mirror for that person. And I'd like to do, um, I still have time, right? OK. This next, next exercise is influenced by Richard Miller. It's called Eye Rest, Integrative Restoration, slash Yoga Nidra. And the reason that it has that name first is that when he was doing this Yoga Nidra meditation with his clients, which at the time were Vietnam vets. The results that he was getting were, I can sleep. I'm not ducking every time a car backfires. I can sleep with my wife again. I'm not creating problems for my family. So they went to the VA and they said, hey, this, this works. We got to get the guys involved in this. Richard Miller went and they were like, yeah, yoga nidra. We can't do anything with that. So he manualized it. And he made it digestible and accessible for government and medical and all of those places that didn't quite vibe with those words. So this next practice is influenced in part by that. I'm going to ask you, again, to be in your seats. And this is something that I learned to do it was crucial in a turning point for my healing in that I could take a moment that threatened to hijack me. So emotions are a big thing that override our system when there's a trigger. And I could, because of the practice, be in that moment, watch whatever it was that was rising, feel it as sensation in my body. If it was important, I'd say I'm coming back to you later. And I'd give it permission to settle. And I retrieved my moment again. So that's what this practice holds as possibility for everyone. So I'll give you a, a, just a few minutes of that, OK? So you might now come back to your seat again, being aware that you're in a seat, and take that attention inward, choosing to have eyes either halfway closed or closed all together, your choice. And then seeing what it's like to be in a body that's supported while also being soft. You might notice your feet. In with the feet. And then the palms in your hands, the softness and warmth in your hands. And as you, we go along, you might listen to the sound of my voice as if it were your own voice. And if you drift or even fall into a light sleep, that's OK. Wherever you start to come back, just pick up wherever it is that we are, not forcing or creating anything, being with what is. So notice sensation in the mouth. 
sensation in the inside of the mouth, the sides of the mouth, tongue. Know that I'm not watching. This moment is yours. Notice the root of the tongue and the tip of the tongue. Let the attention go inward through the ear canals to the outer ears, the architecture of the outer ears. Noticing the sensation in the neck and the head. Aware of the structures in the face, the lips, cheeks, nose, perhaps softness in the forehead, and the eyes, the eyes resting softly. Following attention now down through the spine to the hips, pelvis, and the legs left and right, and the feet. Following sensation up the legs to the arms, left and right, sensation in the arms, the shoulders, the upper arms and elbows, the forearms, wrists, warmth in the palms of the hands and the fingers. Let the attention be drawn to the back, the shoulder blades, and the small curve in the back, and the warmth in the belly, and the area of the heart, sensation in the area of the heart, and then noticing the whole body simultaneously, the whole body, no need to force create anything, everything just as it is, you just as you are. And then letting the attention come back to the area of the heart, perhaps recalling a memory or a thought that brings a smile. Perhaps it's a time with family, or a walk with your dog. Something that makes you smile it comes from the deep, abiding place of the heart, rising and filling every part of the body, radiating inwardly, from infinity and outwardly, with no boundary, no periphery. And then bringing your attention back to the body, coming to the feet, where of the feet, the seat, hands, and then when you're ready, and only when you're ready, orienting to the place in the room. And then, if you like, opening your eyes at any time that you like, being in this place, in this moment. That was three minutes. You might consider gifting yourself minutes like that often. And I'd, I'd like to complete this part before question and answers with a poem that I'd not ask myself to memorize because I didn't want to mess it up. And although not all of it lands in places that I am, it 
covers the intention of what I hope you can walk away with. And it's called Yes, Friend, It Will Matter, and it's by a gentleman by the name of Tom Wright. Say not to me that it will not matter a hundred years from now I was here. For surely I have touched one life in a positive way, perhaps in a daily prayer, I've called your name one day. Having no profound accomplishments or delusions of fame, and leaving no progeny to perpetuate my name, still it will matter I was here. For I have quietly endeavored to sow, and I have watered. I love, and I am loved. Should one desire more? Life is good, and hopefully God is pleased. The tracks I leave, it's true, will not be so ingrained as to stand harsh winds of time, and they shall fade as the evening sun, leaving somewhere only a name and date chiseled in granite. Perhaps, if only in thought, one pausing or me should question, who was that woman? Let God simply whisper, I am hers. You belong to everyone as caretakers. And you're important, important enough to practice. From the depth of my heart, I thank you for showing up today. In the yogic practice, there's a word, namaste. It's a little bit like aloha, where it means hello and goodbye. But basically, it's honoring what's alive inside of me. And when I honor that place in me, and you're honoring that place in you, you recognize that we're Yeah.